Welcome to this research method screencast where we're going to take a look at the use of secondary qualitative data in sociological research. And this is the second screencast analysing the use of secondary data in sociology. And in the first screencast on secondary data uh, we use the example of official statistics to discuss the usefulness of quantitative secondary data uh, in sociological research. Uh, in this particular screencast, we're going to look at the use of qualitative secondary data. And generally, we use this term documents to describe the different types of qualitative secondary data uh, that might be of interest to sociologists. And documents uh, include, most obviously, written texts. So, for example, uh, diaries, letters would be examples of uh, written texts that might be useful to sociologists. But we can also use documents that take the form of other types of text. So we might be looking at paintings, drawings, photographs, as well as the broadcast sounds and images that we associate with the documents that are produced by the mass media. So remember, when we're talking about qualitative data, we're talking about non-numerical data. And this, of course, can take many different forms. And sociologists might make use of the following types of documents when they're carrying out secondary research. Firstly, they might want to use public documents in their research. And public documents are produced by organisations. So that might include uh, documents that are produced by government departments, uh, businesses, schools, universities, uh, pressure groups, charities, and of course the mass media. Secondly, sociologists might want to use personal documents, uh, sometimes also referred to as life documents. And these are produced by individuals and include items such as letters, diaries, photo albums and autobiographies. So these are first person accounts of social events and personal experiences that often include the writer's feelings and attitudes. And then finally, uh, we might also want to make use of historical documents. And historical documents is simply the term that we use to describe uh, personal or public documents that were created in the past. Now, the use of documents in sociological research has several obvious practical advantages for sociologists. Uh, firstly, documents might be the only available source of information. And this might be particularly the case if you're studying social change and you want to look at people's experiences in the past. Secondly, the use of documents in sociological research might be considered a practical alternative to doing primary research because secondary documents are free or cheap uh, because somebody else has already gathered the information. And linked to this, the third practical advantage of doing secondary research using documents rather than doing primary research is using existing documents saves the sociologist time. There are of course also practical problems sometimes with the use of documents. It's not always possible to gain access to the types of documents that sociologists need for their research and even when they can get uh, documents that seem to be relevant Individuals and organisations, of course, create documents for their own purposes, not the sociologists. And therefore, a potentially relevant document uh, might not contain answers to the kinds of questions that the sociologist wishes to ask. Now, there are some particular issues that are worth emphasising if you get an exam question about the usefulness of personal documents in sociological research. And examples of personal documents would include uh, things like diaries and letters and emails. Uh, personal documents, we could argue, tend to be valid and honest because they are usually very, very personal and are not usually produced with the intention of publishing them. So it's more likely that people will write their feelings down uh, in an honest way. And diaries and letters and so on can also allow us to develop empathy for the people that we study. Remember, sociologists use the term Verstehen when they're describing the importance of this particular issue. 
so personal documents are written in the author's own words and so give their meanings and feelings about their lives. And therefore, I think we can argue from an interpretivist perspective, uh, they would be seen as providing richness and depth to a sociological study. However, there can be some problems with the use of personal documents in sociological research. Personal documents are, of course, written from one person's point of view, and so may be biased or misleading. And also, as we can see with the example of a Facebook profile, people often try to present themselves in a positive light. So they engage in a process that Goffman uh, calls impression management uh, when they're producing personal documents sometimes. Uh, and this is particularly a problem if personal documents are being produced with the intention of further publication. So, for example, a politician's diaries are likely to present the politician and their ideas in a favourable light. And finally, because personal documents are uh, very, very personal, they're not representative and, of course, you cannot repeat or often check them. So there are issues in terms of their reliability. To get the most out of documents in sociological research, John Scott argues that we need to assess uh, the value of documents in terms of four criteria. Uh, authenticity, credibility, representativeness and meaning. So authenticity is about whether or not uh, the document that we're looking at is genuine. So the types of questions that sociologists uh, should ask to ascertain the authenticity of documents are questions such as, is the document what it claims to be? Uh, is it complete? Uh, is it a copy? Uh, is it free from errors? And who actually wrote the document? Credibility is about the truthfulness of the contents of the document. So the types of questions that sociologists should be asking to ascertain the credibility of a document are questions such as, is the document believable? Uh, was the author being sincere when they wrote the document? And has the document uh, been distorted for either intended or unintended reasons? For representativeness, the types of questions that sociologists should be asking is whether or not the evidence uh, provided in the document is typical uh, or a one-off. And other issues that are relevant here is when we're looking at secondary documents, particularly historical documents, we've got to ask ourselves whether or not the surviving documents are typical of the ones that got destroyed uh, or lost. And of course, not all surviving documents are even available for researchers to use. So there might be certain types of uh, public documents that are produced by the government uh, that are not available uh, for at least 30 years uh, due to issues of national security. And then finally, Scott argues that in order to ascertain uh, the meaning of the document, uh, we need to ask ourselves the question, what does the document mean to those people produced it, uh, but also to the people who see and hear it, uh, and how does that relate to the way in which the researcher interprets the meaning of the document. And the key issue here, as you can see from the cartoons, is to be aware that documents are obviously open to multiple interpretations. In other words, to use the jargon, uh, documents are polysemic, they're capable of being read in a variety of different ways.